My name is Lisa Wasco de Vetter. I am the Small Fruit Horticulturalist at the Washington State University Research and Extension Center in Mount Vernon. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that center, we are located about halfway between Seattle, Washington, and Vancouver, Canada. So I started my program in March of 2014, I'm originally from Iowa. So I'm learning a lot with Tom about production in the Pacific Northwest of some of these new and also traditional small fruit crops as well as some of the pests. But ever since I started my program, I've been interested in new tools and techniques to advance small fruit horticulture. And biodegradable mulches represents one of those potential tools that could have application in small fruit production, particularly when we talk about strawberries, day neutral strawberries grown in plastic culture. So the goal of my presentation today is to introduce to you all what biodegradable mulches are, some of my experiences that I've had to date with biodegradable mulches, and then go over some of the preliminary data that I've gotten for some research under, going on in my program with these collaborators. So Dr. Carol Miles, she is a vegetable horticulturist at the center. She's worked extensively with biodegradable mulches in vegetable production systems. Shyam Sablani, he is a biosystems engineer and provides information on how these um, mulches functionally respond under environmental conditions and how they, some of the chemicals might migrate to developing fruits. That's going to be talked a bit more when I talk about the research that is undergoing in my program. And then the master student, Curtis Fostich, who just started in my program, who will be leading the field research. So I want to first start with the acknowledgement. So the research project that I will be talking about is funded through Washington State University's internal program called Emerging Research Issues. I also want to acknowledge the biodegradable mulch manufacturers and growers that I've worked with in Washington. I'm very fortunate that one of the biodegradable mulch manufacturers in the country, well, one of about five biodegradable mulch manufacturers in the company is located in Burlington, so it's right next door to Mount Vernon. So it's been really useful to learn more about how these products are engineered and some of the nuances from a manufacturing perspective of these products. And then I want to acknowledge the program who helps with the field application um, and the field work, as well as uh, Curtis here, who's the student who's, again, leading the book research as a graduate student. I also want to mention up the front that when I talk about the specific biodegradable mulches, I'm not going to disclose the actual product names. Uh, that's due to an agreement that I've reached with the manufacturers because one of the aspects that we're studying in this research is how some of these biodegradable mulches have um, small migratory leachate chemicals that could migrate to developing fruit. But more on that later. So when we talk about biodegradable mulches and the rationale behind biodegradable mulches, a good place to start is to look at plastics in agriculture. So plastics are used tremendously in agriculture. So global demand of just plastic films, which can include mulches or plastic films used for low tunnels and high tunnels, was 9.7 million pounds in 2012. And 40% of that was used for mulching operations. In the US, we use about 1 million pounds of plastics annually in agricultural operations. And when we look down at you know, where are the different market uses of those plastics, mulches or agricultural films rank third in terms of the amount of waste that's generated. Now, most of the mulches, as has been learned through research, are stockpiled, landfilled, and if, in some of the cases, burned. Um, so there are certain states that allow burning of these plastic materials and that can release environmental contaminants into the atmosphere, into the soil in terms of the ash, as well as when they're, when they're burned, they can release carcinogens, which can be a, a compromise for human health. So the picture I'm trying to paint is that when we're talking about plastics in agriculture, they're used extensively, and they do lead to some waste generation issues in terms of how we can handle that waste. And these figures here were provided by um, a colleague of mine, Gene Jones. He works in plastic recycling in the southeastern part of the continental United States. And these are figures from the early 1990s. But it goes to show that when we look at the different market uses of plastics in agriculture within the United States and the amount of waste generated, mulches rank third. Now, the number one use or number one source of plastic waste is actually nursery containers. So 
pots and cell trays and things all along that nature. And there is a lot of research in terms of how we can come up with biodegradable nursery containers as well. And then we have livestock plastics, which was interesting for me to learn. I think so much about plants, I don't really think about animal agriculture, but feed bags and baling twine, that generates a tremendous amount of uh, waste. And then we have our horticultural films, and 55% of those are actually mulch waste. So that brings us to biodegradable mulches, or sometimes referred to as BDMs, for biodegradable mulches. So biodegradable mulches are agricultural mulches that are specifically engineered to biodegrade in the soil upon incorporation. So they are very different from the conventional polyethylene plastic films that are used in plastic culture production. They're made with different materials or different feedstocks. And they're also different than compostable mulches, which we're starting to see more also in um, research and development. So compostable mulches are different in the sense that they are meant to be removed at the end of a production cycle and composted either on farm or at industrial composting facilities. And these are being offered as a potential solution to the waste generation issue. So here I have a picture. This is a starch feedstock in a biodegradable mulch manufacturing plant. And this image here just shows one of two methods in terms of how these films are manufactured. Uh, these are sheets being extruded. So this material is mixed with additives, colorants, different other constituents that give the final mulch its properties. It's melted and then it is uh, extruded in this instance and they're also blown. I'll have a picture of that too just so you can get an idea of how these products are made. So why use biodegradable mulches? I already mentioned that they're being offered as a potential solution for the waste generation issue with regular polyethylene plastics. They're also perceived to be a more sustainable technology. And I want to emphasize that it's perception right now. We really don't have a lot of firm, hard data backing it up and saying this is a more sustainable tool. And I'll go through that here in a moment. But they do provide some of the same horticultural benefits as regular polyethylene plastic mulches. So they minimize evaporative water loss from the soil. They provide weed control. And they also help moderate soil temperature to help promote plant growth and development under certain conditions. They also reduce some of the labor costs associated with removing plastic mulches because these are just meant to be tilled into the soil and biodegrade. They also reduce plastic waste and then if we're looking at the burning side of the equation, if, if some of these plastic films are being burned, well if you just incorporate in the soil you're not really having, you know, you're eliminating that concern of having uh, potentially dangerous or environmentally uh, hazardous chemicals being released in the atmosphere. Now, again, on the sustainability side, these products are expensive. So this is um, one of the products that is out available in the marketplace, Bio360. And one roll that is 48 inches by 500 feet is $95. So it is considerably more expensive, and that's about on par with some of the other products that exist on the marketplace. So in terms of their sustainability, there's a big question about the economic aspect of it, and that's being addressed through other research projects that I've been affiliated with. Lisa? Yes. I was just wondering, do you know by chance what the cost of like a plastic roll of those dimensions would be? Sure. So some of the costs, and I think growers feel free to comment too. So what I've seen is for about 500 feet, uh, everywhere from 40 to $70 is the range for a regular polyethylene plastic film. But just like by the biodegradable mulches, the larger volume you buy, the price goes down, but it is still more expensive than regular polyethylene mulch. And the cost of disposing of the regular, like pulling out and disposing of the regular current plastic versus the biodegradable, should, like, it would be interesting to see that cost added into just, you know, the, the cost of either of those. Right, so Julie's comment was really great, and that's something that's being addressed through another biodegradable mulch project is, you know, it costs, at least for strawberry growers, anywhere from, you know, this one said it would give me $300 to $350 per acre to remove plastic films for strawberry. Now, how much of a savings is that if you also have to take into account the initial cost of the, of the biodegradable mulch is more expensive, but you can incorporate it. So those are things that, you know, we have some economists that are helping us uh, answer this through another project. 
Now I want to just give you a better idea, though, of the life of a biodegradable mulch. Uh, just get, so you can get a full idea of how these are made and what these look like in the field and how they you know, break down, essentially. So this image here shows the other way that these films are manufactured. This is the blowing method. So we have the melted product being blown up, and then there's basically um, air being blown up, and it creates a cylinder of melted plastic that then cools, and then it is coiled up and rolled, and then ex and made into a uh, roll of film. So then we have our film, and then we have field application of these films. These can be machine laid, just like a regular plastic film. And then it starts getting interesting in terms of you know, the biodegradation process or the degradation process. So initially what happens is that these materials undergo physical weathering. It's not biological. The sun, as well as um, temperature and winds, can sometimes facilitate the first breakdown processes. So here we have one of the products that I've been testing, and this is um, already starting to weather. It hasn't been incorporated in the soil. We have no biological activity really at this point. It's just already breaking due to um, the solar radiation and some of the other abiotic elements. Now once it's incorporated or tilled into the soil, it is fragmented into smaller pieces, and that's when native soil microorganisms are supposed to basically utilize that as a carbon source. So it gets incorporated into their microbial biomass, releases carbon dioxide in the air. It's essentially at the end of 13 months to 24 months, you should go back to that particular field site and there should be no mulch fragments remaining in that field afterwards. Now it varies though, I mean, it varies depending on the temperature and the pH of the soil in terms of how quickly these degrade. And that's something we're still trying to get a handle on in terms of how quickly these biodegrade. I want to mention biodegradable mulches and, and organic agriculture because a lot of the interest in biodegradable mulches was fueled by people that are growing organically. However, with the exception of one paper-based product, biodegradable mulches were not allowed in organic agriculture. Now that changed in October of 2014. The NOP said, all right, we are going to allow biodegradable mulches in certified organic production, but you have to meet these specific requirements. The material has to deteriorate in the soil 90% within two years. It can't be manufactured from any excluded methods, any excluded products. It can't have certain additives, and it must be bio-based. It didn't say how much bio-based, but it had to be more than 30%. Now, the most manufacturers say, you know, our best product isn't 30% bio-based. So there's there's issues with trying to get some of the current non-paper-based biodegradable mulches approved for certified organic production. So as of today, there is no biodegradable plastic or biodegradable mulch that is allowed in organic production, with the exception of the paper products. <coughs> Another issue that has emerged is chemical migration. So I alluded to this earlier. So chemical migration occurs between a food contact substance and the food product that is basically held within it. So food contact substances can include things like your paper cups or your plastic cups or clamshell holding your berries. And the FDA has allowable limits in terms of how much chemical leachates or small chemical molecules can migrate from that food contact substance to the food. Now a good example is BPA. So that has been phased out because of concerns about BPA and its health effects on humans. So agricultural mulches, they come into contact with food, but they are not being treated as a food contact substance by the FDA. And we have these biodegradable mulches that are weathering and they're deteriorating at a, at a relatively rapid rate and potentially releasing, releasing chemicals into the fruit. So that has surfaced as a potential issue and something that we're starting to look at within my program is do biodegradable mulches release chemicals that can leachate and migrate into the fruit? So that takes me to my research objective. So the first research objective for the project that has been initiated just last year was to evaluate the suitability of several different biodegradable mulch products in day neutral strawberry production within Western Washington. And the second objective was to determine the occurrence and extent of chemical migration of select chemical constituents within the mulch of films to the strawberry fruit. And this is where Dr. Shyam Saiwani, the engineer, has really been coming into play. 
So the approach for this particular experiment, we started the experiment in uh, March, May of 2014 at the Research Extension Center, and the experiment will terminate at the end of this year. We have five mulch treatments, and I will go over those and have some examples out here in just a moment so you can get a sense of what these different biodegradable mulch products look and feel like. And we used two strawberry cultivars, Albion and Seascape, and everything was replicated, or is being replicated four times. And the data that we're collecting include yield, plant biomass, just to get an idea of how these plants are performing under these different mulch treatments. We're looking at the percent visual deterioration, so how rapidly are these mulches deteriorating? We learned in 2014 that there was one biodegradable mulch product that deteriorated way too rapidly. So by the end of July, or even early August, we basically had no mulch product there. So way too fast. And then we are looking at in-soil deterioration. So we're going to come back at the end of this experiment after the mulch has been incorporated in the soil and look at what mulch fragments are there, if any. And then Dr. Shyam Sablani is helping with the chemical migration component. So this is what the field experiment looks like at the beginning of the year before we planted. And the materials that we are testing include a cornstarch-based material. Now this is uh, derived from corn, which would be an excluded product because it's made from a GMO material uh, according to the organic standards, but that's one of the products. And then the next one is a uh, polyhydroxy alkanoate product. Um, this is one that deteriorated much too rapidly for our conditions. And you can see too in parentheses uh, the mills for these different products. The next one is, this is a paper-based product, it's a cellulose-based product, and this one is allowed for certified organic production. And then we have our standard black polyethylene plastic film, and that's our control. And then we also have a control of no mulch. Lisa? Yes? Could the, could the corn starch-based film be made with non-GMO corn? It could. There is actually one manufacturer that is looking at non-GMO based corn. But the one that I handed out is not. <laughs> and then the last one, so this is not included in the experiment, but this just wanted to give you an idea. This is um, spun bound polyvinyl lactic acid. This is an example of one of the compostable uh, mulches. Yes? The, the cellulose base that is organically approved, it does have other more inferior qualities. Pardon? Does, what, what are the, the qualities that would not work? Is it weak on? Sure. I can get into that in a few moments. Oh. <laughs> it's good foreshadowing. Sorry. Wendy. <laughs> um, you had mentioned that um, a certain percentage, of it, even if they're bio-based, a certain percentage has to be a biological mm -hmm. So like in the cellulose or the cornstarch, do you know about what percentage? You mentioned something like 30%? Like sure. Yes, so it varies based on the product. It also varies based on the batch. And so I'll talk about some of the challenges with biodegradable mulches. And one of those challenges is that the manufacturers will vary their batch commercially pretty often, almost annually. So really, when we're testing a product, we, or if we're releasing a product, it's hard to, at this point, predict the performance because even if you use the same brand, the same manufacturer, it may not be the same formulation. And so we're learning that this year with our different PHA product, we got another batch of it, and it is behaving completely differently, even though it's from that same manufacturer. Um, and the amount of bio-based material, so this is all private information for the manufacturers. So they don't necessarily say, at this point, we have X percent of bio-based material in that product. Um, at this point, they're just saying, you know, the best we can do is 30% for it to have the properties that we would want in plastic culture systems. So. so this is some of the visual deterioration data that I alluded to. So for our particular experiments, if they're only 20, the plots are only 20 feet long, we can leave the material. Um, and so this is what it looks like at the beginning, um, well, close to the beginning, in May of 2014. And so one is our cornstarch-based film, two is our PHA-based biodegradable mulch film, three is our paper film, and four is our standard black polyethylene film. 
So they all look actually pretty decent. Um, the paper-based product, though, it was really difficult to create holes to plant our plants in because if you punched a hole, it would rip, and that rip only got bigger and bigger and bigger over time. And that also created basically a place for wind to lift it and carry it off to somewhere where you didn't want it. So those, that was one challenge. So this is flash forward in July of 31, and we collected photos every two weeks from the same plot just to kind of get an idea over time what these mulches behave and what they look like. And so these are the same plots, same plants in our, uh, this is our cornstarch based film, this is our PHA based film, so by July of 31st it was al already significantly weathering. And so much by the time we really started getting fruit production, you could not see it was there. It weathered way too quickly. Three, at this point, you know, our, our plants had grown in pretty well and it was holding the paper in place. Uh, it was not the case this year. I have a picture to show that. And then we have, again, our regular plastic film. This is the total yield for Albion on planting year, uh, to me, of Albion and Seascape. So, we have total yield, we estimated pounds per acre based on our plots, and then we have our mulch treatments on the x-axis. One is our cornstarch-based film, two is our PHA-based film, three is our paper-based film, four is our black, our black polyethylene film, and five is our no-mulch control. And then the bars, the blue represents Albion, and the red represents Seascape. So we can see Seascape perform better in terms of overall yield, for this particular year relative to Albion. And then when we look at the differences within the mulch treatments, we didn't run the statistics on this yet, but essentially it looks like there's really no differences in terms of the amount of yield that we're seeing when we look at within a cultivar, the exception being that we do see declines in yield without the mulch. So just demonstrating that you know, mulches do provide a benefit in terms of heat <coughs> suppression, and you know they also can help reduce soil toxicity, moderate soil temperature, and reduce um, evaporative loss of water. Okay, thank you. So some of the production challenges I already alluded to um, the paper being very light. As soon as this paper product goes into the ground, it starts the the mulch part that gets into contact with the soil starts starts to biodegrade very rapidly, and also there. The way that we plant, it tears really easily, and if you have a strong gust of wind, it just carries it off to another location. So this happened this year, um, about three of our plots, basically one evening we came in our properties. So future challenges. Uh, Whitney already asked about bio-based aspect of it and that kind of brought into this whole question of formulations change within a manufacturer. So if the formulations are always changing, the product and its characteristics change. And so that makes it really hard to kind of predict what the performance will be long run because we don't really have a stable product. Also, we're learning what's compatible with strawberry system. So this particular experiment we looked at spring planting. Is there anything that would be compatible with fall planting? We don't know that yet. The other question is if there's a future for biodegradable mulches in organic agriculture. So there's a lot of growers nationally that are interested in biodegradable mulches in their organic production settings, but again, right now there is no biodegradable mulch other than paper products that is usable in organic production for the reasons I specified. 
Also, just talking to some larger operations, even down at Driscoll's, they said that they've experimented with some of the biodegradable mulch products, and the main challenge for them has actually been application. You can machine lay it, but the rolls are significantly heavier. So you have to spend more time getting a roll, loading it up, and then you know, laying it, and then going back and getting another roll. And so that proved to be very challenging. There's also the effects on fruit quality, so we're still looking at that migration component, if that's a concern. And then another really interesting thing, I often think about soils, as I think soils are one of our precious resources. So what is the effect of biodegradable mulches on soil health and soil quality? If we're continually tilling this into the soil, are we pushing the soil microbial community to a certain um, ecology, certain populations? Um, is that good? Is that bad? Is it just that? Also, are there any smaller fragments that you know we don't see but are still remaining, and will that change the overall soil quality? So these are all questions that are being asked. There's more questions being asked, and some of these, like the latter one, is actually being addressed, and some of the economic ones being addressed through a, a, a SCRI project that's, um, that I've been involved with. So as I close, I just want to mention there are a few other applications that have surfaced, um, some not my own invention, some from other growers. Um, in terms of biodegradable mulches. So one is the use of biodegradable mulches for establishing tissue culture plants. So Eric Gerant from BC, the researcher that Wendy mentioned, he found that tissue culture raspberry plants establish much more rapidly when grown in plastic culture. And the next, but there is challenges with removing that plastic as I've already addressed. So one potential option is growing them with um, a biodegradable mulch that weathers quickly so you don't have to be concerned about trying to remove that plastic film. The other one is some of the compostable films as a substitute from some of the polyethylene plastic film. And then also some of that has emerged from the biodegradable mulch manufacturers is the possibility of compostable drip tape. So here are a few resources too if you have any questions. Feel free to email me or ask me now or later throughout the day. There's also several good publications on biodegradable mulches. But with that, I just want to thank you all for your attention and thank you all for having me. I was trying to get a really cute picture of my daughter eating strawberries, but she eats them too quickly. So like she just gobbles them up. So that's the best I could do. Any questions for Lisa? So are there known chemical leaching issues with conventional plastic mulch? There is none in the United States. There has been some done in Europe. Um, a lot of it actually has focused less on the mulch itself, but the mulch's ability to absorb pesticides and how that can migrate to fruit. Okay, but from the plastic itself, there's not documented. Uh, there has been some documented in Europe from the plastics, and so these were some studies done in Italy where they did find that there was some migration. So that's an important point, though, is that just because there's migration, it doesn't mean it's necessarily chemicals that are hazardous to human sure. health, too. But basically, it's a proof of concept. Does this or does this not happen? And then the idea being we can take that to our biodegradable mulch manufacturers that we work closely with and just say, here's some information that we've uncovered. This is information for you to kind of go through and decide what you want to do with in terms of your productions. Okay. Yes. So the question is: Is there any issues with some of the material binding up? And um, not that I have encountered. And not that um, Dr. Carol Miles, she's the vegetable horticulturist that has spent years working with us, has encountered. Is the third percent is, is the chemical that you have to do and then the 70% is not decomposable? Oh, so the, the question 30% decomposable or bio and the 70% not. So that goes back to the whole discussion about the amount of, uh, of bio based material within the film. So, the mulch manufacturers are saying we cannot have more than 30% bio-based material in our final mulch product. And Omri and the NOP wants higher than that. So they're saying we can't get above 30% and have the 
structural and mechanical features that would be compatible with plasticulture systems. So there's a little bit of debate between the NOP and the biodegradable mulch manufacturers on that aspect. Lisa, what percentage of the uh, paper then? What, what's the percentage of plastic degradable? Is 100% of that one is degrade? Is 100%? Yeah, so Wei's question was what percent does the paper biodegrade? A lot of this again depends on the soils that you're working in, but for us, you will see us in Mount Vernon, two years, it will be completely gone. The goal is, you know, 90% of the paper-based products, it's gone much faster than that. And we don't have time course data at this point in the research in terms of, you know, how quickly it biodegrades in the soil. So we can't say nine months, eight months. We know two years it's gone. All right, let's do like maybe one more question and then we got to wrap up and move on. So the gentleman in the white shirt. Thank you. I had a question. Uh, you mentioned crystals and how they were having trouble uh, applying the plastic because it was heavier. Well, yeah. Could you speak more on that, why that would be? Sure. So the question was Driscoll's and a couple other larger growers articulated some issues with uh, with applying the mulches. So they said that um, it was heavier and you didn't have as much um, length of the, on the roll as you would with their polyethylene plastic that they were using. So it was heavier and also you would have to reload the roll more frequently to get the same distance compared to what they were traditionally doing. And was that the paper product that was heavier? Is that, the that was um, the paper product, I believe. I can't say 100%. They just, generalities there. Thank you. Great. Give us a hand.